Hi, and welcome to Smart Training 365. This is Mo Larby, and I'm with Doug Brignoli. How are you doing, Doug? Hey, Mo. How are you? Doing great. Obviously, uh, from the thumbnail, everyone knows that uh, in this video, we're going to be responding to uh, Mike Israel video, uh, Renaissance Periodization. Uh, I personally liked his video. Uh, hey, Mike, I'm sure you're watching. Uh, great video, great job on uh, like the way you presented it, the way you thought it through, um, very respectful. I think uh, the questions that you asked, uh, many can benefit from them. Many share with you the same question. We are like uh, a new people start to know about us, but you know, our YouTube channel is like a year old. So people started to learn more and more every day. And I think honestly, like I've been watching your video, I watch other videos and I know that uh, what is needed today is conversation like this or debate, not debates. I think it's more talking scientifically about resistance training. You know, uh, you got we got someone like you, uh, someone like Doug, 43 years in the fitness industry, biomechanics. So uh, in my opinion, many people will benefit from this video. Realistically, a crap load of people have been asking. So I got to get this off my chest, make this video. Uh, give you guys what you want to see, and that is my analysis of uh, Doug's training methods. So who is Doug and what are his methods? He's a, a former top-tier competitive bodybuilder. He's like, I think, 50-something, and he looks phenomenal, and he's super, super jacked back in, I think, the 80s. So really guy who walks the walk. And the awesome thing about him is that him and his team, they really think about training. They're not just like, do this, shut up, which is really, really refreshing to see. It's really, really good. And it's kind of his core offering, or maybe best phrased as his most well, popular offering, the, what has garnered a lot of attention and a lot of the questions to myself, is the Brig 20, which is a list of 20 exercises that are um, the best exercises as claimed for all of the muscles of the human body that you would like to develop. And this is kind of an analysis of sort of that line of thinking here. So... Um, <laughs> The thing that's interesting here is that um, I, I, I get that Mike wants to do an analysis of Doug's method, but that requires knowing what Doug's method is. And it requires knowing what the Brig 20 are. Uh, and anyone who knows the Brig 20 knows that the Brig 20 isn't just 20 exercises, it's 20 best movements. So it ends up being about 47 exercises because each one of those 20 has a second best, third best, fourth best. So that gives people a lot of variety, but they know what the main thing is. They know what the ideal thing is. Um, and so um, if they can't do the ideal thing for whatever reason, then they have these options and they know they're in the ballpark. So for one, the Brig 20 is more than just 20 exercises. And for two, the Brignoli method is more than just the Brignoli 20. So, you know, doing a, an analysis on, uh, on Doug's method without having read the book, without knowing the whole thing. It's like asking a movie reviewer to do a movie review and he agrees to do it and he hasn't really seen the movie. Maybe he's just seen reviews, other people's reviews of the movie, but he hasn't actually seen the movie. So it, it, you'll, you'll discover throughout this thing that there's a lot of things that are not quite right. And point three is that such an analysis using primarily biomechanical inference can rank order exercises at, the, at least very charitably into the best exercises, meh exercises, and why would you do that exercises? And I think in the Brig 20, it's more specifically like, well, actually here are the best and everything else is maybe not as good. So um, what I say in my book is that there are parameters that determine an exercise as being better than or worse than. So, um, and this is the key thing. So. In my book, what I explain are principles. And then you apply those principles in the analysis of an exercise, and it lets you see where that exercise lies in terms of the scale of good to bad. Um, it's not an opinion. It's just, you'll see there's, there's 16 factors, very rational, logical, pragmatic, scientifically sound, factors that point you in a certain direction or point you away from a certain direction and let you decide what you want to do, knowing what constitutes a better exercise, what constitutes a less good exercise. 
So um, what I want you to see here is uh, you'll see there that what I'm showing you is uh, a side view of a guy uh, doing what might be considered flat dumbbell presses for the chest. Obviously, he'd be lying down if he was using dumbbells. But the direction of arm motion, flat, decline, incline. Now, the thing on the left side of that image there is a, is a popularly circulated uh, graph, I guess you could say, that shows that the horizontal pushing is the middle packs, lower packs, and then it says right there, upper packs. What I've done is I put it back to back with this man so that you could see that if you push your arms in that blue dot, green dot direction, angling up, you're not moving towards his chest you're moving towards the neck or the chin, right? So there are no pectoral fibers there. Now, there's a simple rule, and the rule is all muscles pull toward their origins. They can do nothing other than pull toward their origins. And so on the next graphic too there, I've, I've, I've illustrated it a little bit better. So on the guy on the right, obviously he's in position B, he's pulling that box. When he pulls that box, that box will move in the A in the B direction. It will not move in the C direction or in the A direction. But on the right, I put a picture of myself with my arms up, and you can see that pushing my moving my arms, pulling my arms in the A direction moves in toward my chin. Right? And the B direction is actually not quite parallel to my shoulder. It's actually slightly lower than my shoulder, which indicates already a slight decline direction of push. Right? So this is what I mean by, you know, guidelines that allow the user to know when they're moving closer to ideal or farther away from ideal, right? So the rule is muscles always pull toward their origin. The origins start on the highest part of the sternum. Yes, there's some clavicular fibers, which we'll discuss in just a moment. But, but the rule of thumb is when you move your arms toward the highest part, of the pectoral fibers on the sternum, you're moving in a flat bench direction. Now, as you start moving in an upward direction, you move farther and farther and farther away <laughs> from those sternal and clavicular fibers. Now, if you move your arm up like this, yes, you're gonna get some clavicular fibers, but if you go past the clavicle, there's no way, like if I'm standing here with the clavicle, there's no way <laughs> I'm gonna, be able to, to, to take it over my head. I can pull it toward me. And that's all I can do. But once it arrives, I can't do anything more. When it keeps going, the suggestion is that somehow I'm now pushing it <laughs> over me. <laughs> and obviously you can't do that. So this is what my book and the principles are about. It's a set of parameters that allow the user to know what constitutes ideal anatomical motion ideal joint motion, ideal loading in terms of early phase, late phase, et cetera. And when you use these 16 factors as a checklist, it points to this one or this one as being the ones, the exercise that's most in compliance, maybe a close second, a close third, maybe a farther back fourth, farther back fifth, Okay, you decide. Now that you know the range, you can decide. I'm not dictating these are the 20, these are the only ones that are good, everything else is shit. I'm not saying that. Okay, so that is a misunderstanding for those who think that's what we say, that is not what we say. So on uh, number three there, slide three, um, I, this is from my book. So again, if Mike had the book and he saw this right there, he would be better informed about what the Brignoli method is. It is not just physics. The title is the physics of resistance exercise, but it's much more as you'll soon see. So um, the figure on the left there is a man figuratively uh, uh, a pectoral fiber pulling parallel to those fibers, pulling on the insertion point of the humerus. And you can see he's pulling toward the middle of the sternum. So at that point right there, there's about the same amount of pectoral fibers above that line and below that line. There's slightly more below that line, but you can see that he's pulling in a direction where the majority of pectoral fibers are situated, right? So if you want to do one exercise and you're going to hit the most number of pectoral fibers, you want to move your arms in a slightly declined direction. Now, the figure there on the right 
that man is pulling as if you're, that is an upper pectoral fiber pulling toward the chin. And you can see there, that's impossible. There's no way he, he's not even pulling parallel to the clav, to the clavicular pectoral fibers. So, so that's an important thing to know when you're, if you want to evaluate the book or you want to evaluate the method, you have to know what that's all about. So um, for those that are wondering what these 16 factors are, because again, this is not just physics. These 16 factors are divided into the ideal musculoskeletal motion for each muscle and each joint. And there's thorough explanations and illustrations in the book which explain why and how. There's physiological factors, things like bilateral deficit, things like active and passive insufficiency, things like, you know, uh, cross-education, unilateral loading, blah, blah, blah. There's some neurological factors, namely reciprocal innervation. These play a role in exercise value. And the last one, of course, is the physic factor, which is the fact that our bones are limbs, levers, essentially, and they operate in conformance with the laws of physics. It's undeniable. So um, it's a pretty complete, comprehensive thing for anyone to sort of think that the Brig 20 is just a matter of math, matter of physics, uh, is, is mistaken about what they think. And it sounds like that's the beginning of, of where Mike starts to sort of not understand what we're actually doing. So uh, what's an example, one of the examples given in a variety of the sort of literature that's being produced in videos is, uh, and there's a f f more than a few of these, was like if you're doing regular barbell squats, there's a ton of tension on the quads at the bottom of the movement. But as you go up higher and higher in the movement, what ends up happening is the quads contributing less and less because they're very, very biomechanically well leveraged at that point. The external load is the same. So you can kind of coast through the top half, top third of the movement and not get a ton of quad activation because the quads really aren't pushing against much of anything. On the other hand, something like sissy squats, especially in the sissy squat machine, which you, you put your feet in and you can actually push against the pad and sit back and come back up. You guys like this digital little like CGI shit I'm doing with my fingers. In such a sissy squat setup, not only is there a lot of force at the bottom of the movement where the quads uh, have been fully stretched, but also there's a force all the way through the movement because you're using not just a leg press motion to stand up, but a combination press and extension. And so even at the very top of the movement, the quads are still very well engaged in the sissy squat, which would hypothetically make the sissy squat or some version of it uh, superior to the barbell squat, at least in this example, because it allows the muscle to remain more active for more time and actually challenges it at various degrees of motion versus just really challenging it one and not a ton at the other, right? So perhaps CC squats are less superior um, from the perspective, especially of how much external load they impose, which isn't that much, versus how much uh, biomechanically inferred muscle activation they demand. So uh, some solid stuff here. So <laughs> I never said that. What Mike is saying that I said about the squat, what is wrong with the squat is not something that I've ever said ever. What he's suggesting is that I am somehow against continuous tension, that, I, that I'm pro-continuous tension, that I'm uh, marking down the squat because it loses its resistance at the top. That is not what is wrong with the squat. There's a lot of things wrong with the squat. But that is never something that I said was wrong with the squat. So on this slide here, number four, from my book. Again, if Mike had just had the book and he would go right to the squat section, you would see all the things that I talk about as problematic with the squat, none of which have anything to do with having the resistance diminished toward the top. Okay, so, and again, this goes back to him thinking that I'm only thinking physics. I'm only thinking that, the resistance diminishes and that's somehow bad. And then maybe I don't understand the physiological benefits of that. Okay, so here's the problem with a squat. It is that the, we're talking about limbs as levers. The lower leg is the quadricep lever, right? So when you're standing before you descend in the squat and your lower leg is vertical and your femur, your upper thigh bone is vertical and your torso is vertical, yes, you have compression yes it feels heavy but your quads are not contracting you tap tap your quadriceps let somebody else tap your quadriceps tap your glutes no contraction yet no no muscle force required to be in that position because 
basically at that point, the lower leg and the upper leg and the torso are basically support beams, like in a building, right? They are not being challenged to the left or to the right, to the front or to the rear. They're just bearing weight through the column, okay? When you descend, that lower leg goes from neutral to 30 degrees, approximately. 30 degrees from the neutral position, I should say. Now, a, a maximized lever is one that's horizontal when you're dealing with free weight gravity. And so it's far from that. It's, it's even far from being at a 45 degree angle. It's only at a 30 degree angle. And these are percentages, percentages of how active that lever is. So if it's parallel with direction of resistance, it's 0% active. If it's horizontal, again, dealing with free weight gravity, it's 100% active, meaning you're going to get 100% of the available load. Now, I always tell people in the book, and you'll see it there in a second, this is not about people needing to learn trigonometry to lift weights. This is about just knowing what's more and what's less. So a ballpark figure is if it's halfway between 100% and zero, it's a 50% lever, 45 degree angle. The lower leg has not even reached that level, which means that it's not even half loading the weight that you're using onto your quads, not even half. And your quad is stronger than being able to handle that much. So you put more weight on the spine to compensate for the reduced level of efficiency of that lower leg lever, right? So you can get the same amount of load on your quadriceps without the weight on your back just by allowing your lower leg to get more horizontal. Now, here's the problem is that you're trying to use one direction of resistance during a squat to activate the glutes and the quads. And each of those would benefit most from its own direction of resistance. But because they're sharing the one direction of resistance, they both get compromised. So as you'll see there in this, um, in this slide, the, the picture on the left shows that the lower leg dips forward about 30 degrees. On the next page over, you see I've drawn ABC there. And what I'm showing you is how active the femur lever is as a glute operator, right? So what's happening there is that you have about an 18 inch femur and there it is horizontal. So great, you have a horizontal fully active lever, but the lower leg is doubling under that femur, that the primary lever and is therefore reducing its moment arm. And I'll show you what that means in just a second. But basically where that C is from A to C is now the length of that femur. And you're getting half the magnification that you could be getting, even though it's active, half the length reduces its magnification by half. Right? So if you were to, to be able to do a glute exercise where you can put a roller right at the end of your femur, you would get 100% of your femur length, you'd get twice as much load with the same amount of weight or the same amount of weight with half as much load, right? So these are important things to know, right? When I say squats aren't particularly good, what I mean is that they're not fuel efficient, energy efficient. It requires a lot of additional weight to compensate for these mechanical shortcomings. And and then that means compressing your spine more. And most of you can see their illustration on the, the far right that the torso is also a, le a lever. Now, this one right here is drawn, I would say, sort of euphemistically. In other words, it is drawn with an angle that is similar to the same angle as the lower leg. When in fact, most people the squat lean farther forward than that. And the torso is a longer lever than the lower leg lever, which means you're getting more load on the lower back because of the farther forward lean and the longer lever length than you are on the quadricep, even though the goal is quadricep loading, not lower back loading. So th these are mechanical issues with the squad. There's also a reciprocal innervation issue and a neurological issue, which is that by triggering the hip extensors, you deactivate the hip flexors. And one of the hip flexors is the, the, the uh, rectus femoris, which is part of your quadricep, part of your target muscle. So you're having to use more weight than you need, and you're having some neurological deactivation of your target muscle. It's just not a smart exercise. If you wanted to load the quadriceps without the neurological deactivation, you could load it more with less weight. If you just use that lower leg lever, 
with a more perpendicular angle to resistance. And the same goes for the quadricep. OK, so now here on the next page, and this is slide five, here is a friend of mine, Itaru Naito, in Japan doing a squat. And there you can see how far forward his torso is and compare that to his lower leg. You can see that he's got more forward lean on his torso. And, his, and by the way, his lower legs are almost vertical. That means he's getting a very small percentage of what he's lifting on his quadriceps. This is just quantifiable. This is not, this is not just an opinion. Now, on that page on the right, what I'm showing you, there is a, is a, a spine and how it's curved and how when you press down on this accordion-like thing, it stands to reason that the heavier the weight, the more that pushes those curves into more drastic curves, which is now you're talking about the risk of herniation. So from the standpoint of if you just wanted to do a fitness exercise, it's perfectly okay to do a squat. In fact, it's perfectly okay to use maybe 50, 100 pounds on squat. It's nominal. But once you start pushing the limits, once you start trying to squat extreme amounts for the goal of maximizing quadricep development, what you are getting is a rapidly increasing cost and a slowly increasing benefit. And it's just not a smart exercise. It might make you feel good. It might allow you to feel in beast mode. It might let your your observers, you know, be impressed, which is might be good for you. They'll give you some accolades. Great. But, and if you're there for that, then great. I'm not knocking that. But if you're there to build muscle and you want to do it the smartest way possible, you know, you want to maximize the magnification, not minimize the magnification so that you can use less weight and get more load and less skeletal abuse. Now, he said something about the sissy squat bench, and he was completely wrong about the sissy squat bench. It is not continuous tension. He was saying it was continuous tension. And so there, no, it does the same thing the squat does. It increases the load as you go down. It decreases the load as you go up. Okay. So, but what's fascinating about this particular bench is the direction of resistance is completely different. Okay. Now that little balsa wood model that I have there, when I did that YouTube video, I have that version on the bottom, which is the descended version. And then I have the standing version. And I took that little balsa wood bench, which has the same pad at the top of the lower leg and the same pad at, at the ankles. And I put, I, I elevated it and I held it like this. And then I let go of the man and he went straight down, indicating the direction of resistance is straight down. But as soon as I put this man in there and I hooked his ankles in there, and I let it go. I could hold this guy right here. And he was not sliding down. In fact, it's easy to find pictures of people doing this bench and their feet are not even touching the ground. Indicating that the direction of resistance is drastically different than that of the squat. What's happening is by leaning back, you are now creating a pivot around that upper pad at the top of your lower leg. That is now a pivot. And so the whole thing is falling this way, which is pushing your lower leg forward. You're pushing against that ankle pad. There's a thing in biomechanics called ground reaction force, which is that whatever, whenever you push against an immovable object, it pushes back with an equal and opposite direction and amount of force. So that's why there is that big red arrow there indicating that it's like a leg extension. That is actually pushing on that ankle and you are basically straightening your knees as if it was a leg extension and your torso is going along for the ride. Now, it may look like your hip extending because you're rising, but what's actually happening is your femur is rising and your torso is basically sitting at the end of this rising bone, right? You're, since you're not getting a vertical direction of resistance, you can't push down with your femur. You can't. All you can do is push forward with your tibia, right? So, is this a good exercise? Yes, it is a quad specific exercise. It is significantly different than a squat. But the reason that Mike said was this was a good exercise is not the reason this is a good exercise. It does not offer continuous tension, which isn't a bad thing. It's perfectly okay to get to the top and have the resistance end. There's nothing wrong with that. And what's wrong with the squat isn't that the same thing happens there. 
What's wrong with the squat? All those other things that I talked about. So here you can see the table of contents. I want you all to see and Mike to see that what we talk about is a lot more than just physics. Chapter three is mechanical disadvantage. That refers to the angle at which the muscle pulls on a limb, which increases its magnification or decreases it depending on the angle. Chapter four is the resistance curve. The next slide, slide eight. Chapter six, primary and secondary levers. What is a secondary lever? Right? Here's, um, uh, what is centrifugal force? What is momentum? These are all explained in here. Um, chapter eight, um, uh, opposite position loading. Is the muscle you're targeting directly positioned opposite the load? Chapter nine, dynamic versus static muscle contraction. If he, if he just saw the table of contents, he would see that our book, our course, is far more than just physics. Chapter 10, uh, uh, what is the all or nothing principle of muscle contraction? Reciprocal innervation. So you can pause your video and check, check a look at these things yourself. Slide 10 there, just look at the, at the green arrows, and you can see all the things that the book covers. Slide 11, you can see all the body parts. Yeah, so that's such a good example. Number two, it's definitely a good idea to try to develop some kind of ranking system so you can sort of ordinarily rank uh, exercises between probably better exercises and probably worse. Like for building quads, I would say like high bar squat, hack squat, leg press somewhere up here in my view. And then like BOSU ball, one-legged squat with somebody yelling at you uh, all the way down at the bottom. Uh, insert your favorite Joel Seedman reference here. So, so um, again, you know, the 16 factors that are our ranking system is on my website. Um, we talk about it frequently. Uh, why he doesn't know that we have a ranking system uh, or that he's recommending that people have that without recognizing that that is precisely what these 16 factors do they rank an exercise on how energy efficient it is on how anatomically correct it is on how it avoids or doesn't avoid any neurological interference or you know whether it has the proper resistance curve or not right so it, that is what the 16 factors are it's a ranking system measurements made uh by biomechanical inference alone are very very fraught so you don't want to use biomechanical inference, in, in other words, doing some back of the envelope calculations and sort of really judiciously saying this exercise wins on that calculation, this exercise loses, thus this exercise is superior and this is inferior. Uh, biomechanics is not the only thing you consult. The way muscles are shaped is actually different inside the muscle itself. And the way they're attached to various joints is not something you can replicate very easily with just like a very simple model. And how exercises stimulate muscles can be actually a bit more nuanced than just straight biomechanical analysis would imply. Um, just a really quick example, you'd say, well, you know, the bench press is inferior because towards the bottom of the movement, you have really good pec activation. But as the movement reaches the top, maybe dumbbell press and you get here, you don't have a lot of activation in the pecs at the top, so you're missing something. Well, uh, standalone, that seems fine. But then you actually combine that with the research that shows that probably you get more growth at the bottom, super deep, painful stretch of a movement than you do at the top when it's not, uh, the muscle is contracting and not in a lengthened position. Then all of a sudden it seems like, wait, so if like things like squats and um, presses are very hard at the bottom, easier at the top, uh, that doesn't match the perfect linear force curve that we would sort of say, oh, biomechanically, this would be ideal, but it actually matches the force curve of what causes hypertrophy more. So it turns out that a perfectly linear force curve, same amount of sort of necessity for your muscles to contract here and here, may actually not even be desirable and it may actually be less efficient. So just on that alone, biomechanical inference uh, should be something you tread very lightly on, very carefully, and also not invest a lot of stock into. So this is, I guess you could say evidence that Mike doesn't really understand what biomechanics is. 
because he is treating it as if it is strictly math. Biomechanics is biology and mechanics. Biomechanics doesn't require a perfectly linear curve, resistance curve. And as I said, I mean, biology tells us that early phase loading is good. Late phase loading, lightening up is good. Biomechanics says that. Biomechanics doesn't say numbers, numbers, numbers. All right, so here it is, right from my book, slide 13, the ideal resistance curve, early phase loading. And in that box right there, you can see that William Kramer, PhD, informs us that at the optimal length of muscle fiber, there's more strength potential. When a muscle fiber shortens, it loses strength potential because the actin filaments slide over each other and they basically run out of contractile force, right? So, in fact, he's, he's, he's pointing to a flat dumbbell press, suggesting that Doug might not give this exercise its due because it's not a, a linear resistance curve. And guess what? It's one of the break 20 exercises. Not quite the flat bench, but the slightly declined bench exercise. As you can see right there on slide 14, I am doing a flat dumbbell press and explaining why it's good. It's got the right resistance curve. So I, aside from Mike not knowing what I actually teach, it seems that Mike doesn't actually know what biomechanics actually includes because it does include biology. It is not just physics. It's also prone to considerable errors. Um, if you want, you can Google, and this is up on the slides, hopefully right over there, evaluating the efficiency of a resistance exercise. And just if you want to type in dips, comma, dumbbell extensions, uh, this is a sort of in Doug Brignall's blog. It's a sort of sub article in his blog where he analyzes dips versus sort of dumbbell skull crushers and does some mathematics um, to sort of suggest one muscle is, or the triceps are being uh, externally loaded to a certain extent and internally loaded to a certain extent. There's like this 11% multiplier for wrist position and stuff like that. Um, uh, without getting into the, um, the physics of it, that, that analysis is like, uh, how do I phrase this charitably? Uh, woefully inaccurate. Okay, so um, so charitable is is uh, woefully inaccurate. Um, let me start off by saying that the eleven percent had nothing to do with the wrist. Um, and so it it seems to me that Mike was reading this article that I had. And by the way, I encourage you all to go to my blog and look for that article. Me evaluating the efficiency of a resistance exercise and see if you take home from that what he took home from that. And basically what I was talking about is the thing called the moment arm. And the moment arm has to do with, um, and this is an irrefutable physics fact, it has to do with the fact, what I said earlier, which is that a lever, a support beam, a pendulum, is parallel, that's parallel with the direction of resistance with gravity, is neutral. It doesn't require any force. When you are at the top of a parallel bar dip bar, your elbows are locked. You can have someone come up behind you, tap you on the triceps, and they are not contracted yet. I mean, you might tense them deliberately, but you don't have to. You can actually relax your triceps when you're in that vertical position because your forearm is in the neutral position it doesn't require any load to stay in that neutral position. The moment arm is the distance between the pivot, the elbow in this case, and the hand, because that's where the force is being applied. They are on the same. So those two lines are together. They appear as one. Okay, so now let's look at slide 15. This is a scale that I made. Um, and I made it with these angles to show something about a squat, but we can use it just as easily here. So the image on the left shows that I've got a six inch lever on both sides and I've got one heavy nut there, a weight, let's call it a weight on each basket, okay? So the distance between the center is the same on the left and on the right. That distance is called the moment arm. Now I have dropped a second weight into the basket on the left. 
And so now you could see what's happened to that moment arm on the left. It's gotten shorter. Shorter moment arm requires more weight. Longer moment arm requires less weight. That moment arm with two weights is equivalent to the moment arm on the right with one weight, half the weight. I've added a third now on that figure on the right. I've added a third weight to that side. Look what's happened to that moment arm on the left. It's gotten even shorter. So what's happening there is you've got a short moment arm requiring three weights to balance out a much longer moment arm with one weight. Now, the, the lever on the left side of that scale is farther diagonal than your forearm gets when you do a parallel bar dip. So the point is that in order to get the same amount of load with a short moment arm, you need to use a lot more weight to compensate for the fact that it isn't a big moment arm. So I'll, I'll tell you briefly what that article says in terms of the 11%. What that says is this, is that, and let's just, let me just remind you that vertical parallel to gravity is zero. This is 100% horizontal is because it's perpendicular. It's got the widest moment arm. That's 100%. 45 degree angle is about 50%, right? So the best way to quantify, to label the, the angle of that lever is by way of a percentage of saying how, what percentage in the direction of full magnification is it? Okay, so on a parallel bar dip, that forearm dips 11% in the direction of the 100% horizontal. So we're gonna use that as the magnifier. If you weigh 180 pounds and you have two arms, of course we all do, 90 pounds per arm, times the length of the lever, which is about a 12 to one ratio. That has to do with where the muscle connects and where the elbow is, where the joint is, versus where the muscle connects and where the force is being applied. So it's a 12 to one ratio. So you say 90 times 12 times 11%. Now, the one thing that I'm not including there, and I acknowledge it in my book, I'll show it to you in just a second, is the angle of the connection of the tricep on the elbow but it doesn't have to be factored in because that can never change. That is a constant. Regardless of whether you're doing skull crushers or kickbacks or parallel bar dips, it doesn't change. What we wanna measure is the difference between one and the other. So you measure what isn't constant, the variable. And that is the angle of the forearm relative to the direction of resistance. Okay, so we're gonna skip that for a second, but I'll show you that it's in the book. And we say, if you weigh 180 pounds, times 12 times 11%, you're going to get about 119 pounds of load on each tricep. If you go lie down on a flat bench with a pair of 20 pound dumbbells, same math, 20 times 12, but now that lever gets horizontal times 100% is 240 pounds of load on each tricep. And the total energy cost is only 40 total pounds. Now I'm not saying that you should do 20 pound tricep extensions. I'm not saying that that's the equivalent of parallel. No, I'm saying that that gives you an idea of how much more magnification you get when you let that forearm get horizontal. Why do you think that a tricep kickback doesn't load the triceps until you extend it? When your elbow is just hanging from, when your forearm is just hanging vertically from your elbow, you know there's no load on the tricep. Why? Zero moment arm. And then the more that load increases, the, more, the farther the weight gets from the pivot, the more horizontal that form gets, the more magnification you get, right? This is not woefully inaccurate. Now, is it trigonometry? No. And you can see there, there's the illustration of me doing the parallel bar dips. There's the scale showing the 11% tilt of the forearm. And there I am circling this thing, explaining there is an additional factor that further magnifies resistance known as mechanical disadvantage, which will be discussed in the next chapter. For the sake of simplicity, however, you should assume in this instance that the only magnifier is the length and the angle of the forearm. So I acknowledge that, but it is not woefully inaccurate. So um, if you want to experiment with this, you can test this yourself. Just one more way to test this, um, this moment arm principle. Put your arm on a tabletop grab a dumbbell, grab as heavy a dumbbell as you want, 
or as light as you want, but heavier will test it better. I would say grab at least a 30 pound dumbbell, maybe a 40 pound dumbbell. And as long as that forearm is vertical, you'll sense that it's balanced. It does not require any bicep, does not require any triceps, as long as that thing is balanced on that tabletop. Now, as soon as you let it depart from that neutral position, that moment arm starts to increase, right? And the farther it increases, the heavier it gets, right? So the picture at the top is me with the vertical forearm. The picture in the middle is me loading the bicep. Oh, that's it. That's, that's not even the right side. There's a picture that shows where if I tip it back to the other direction, it loads the tricep. Okay, but the point to remember is that it's neutral when it's vertical and it only loads the muscle when it leaves that position and only to the degree of how far it is towards the horizontal. What I'm showing you here is, is the same moment arm example, but I'm using the secondary lever. So you understand how physics works. The image on the left, let's just pretend that's an arm on the left, right? You've got your arm like this. You're doing a flat dumbbell press. As long as that secondary lever is vertical, it weighs the same thing as the lever on the right would connected at that same spot. Those two moment arms there are exactly the same. Now on the picture in the middle, what I've done is I've leaned it to the left, which is increases the moment arm of the entire thing, the, the, the primary and the secondary lever. So now I need two weights on the other side to counterbalance the one where I've extended it. Now in the third picture on the right, I brought it in. And now I need two on the left and one on the right because I've shortened the moment arm on the left. Shorter moment arm requires more magnification, produces less load on a muscle, right? So if you're doing flat dumbbell presses and you bring these dumbbells in really close because you can use a heavier weight, the reason you can use a heavier weight is because you've reduced the magnification. This is not rocket science, by the way. This is just basic physics. So the idea that it would be woefully inaccurate is just like really missing it. This is the endorser of my book, Jeffrey Mackey, one of the endorsers of my book, PhD in physics, works for NASA. He's essentially a rocket scientist. He said everything I wrote in my book is accurate. Now, um, I don't know if Mike is a, is a rocket scientist or not. Not that you need to be, because this is basic physics. But the idea that this person thought it was accurate and Mike thinks it's woefully inaccurate is interesting. These are some of the other endorsers of my book. Wayne Westcott, PhD, exercise science professor, Quincy College. Jacob Rosen, who's a biomedical engineer. He said it was accurate. Bob Eckhart, paleoanthropology, PhD. Now he is in physics, but but he understands joints and he understands evolution and proper anatomical movement. And he's endorsed the book. Stephen Guyanet, PhD, neurology. Fred Hatfield, his PhD, by the way, is in sports psychology, but even someone who understands that he, he won his acclaim in squat understands that when you're talking about exercise science, you're talking about physics and biology and neurology and anatomy. And, and he endorsed my book and Ron Kovitney, PhD or MD, uh, orthopedic surgeon. So these people all say that what I said was accurate. And Mike seems to be the only one who thinks it's woefully inaccurate. And that's being polite. What I have there is I'm explaining that moment arm thing by showing the resistance curve. This is what a resistance curve does in all cases, right? That's why the resistance gets lighter at the top of a tricep extension when you're on your back, right? It gets heavier at the bottom when you're horizontal, it's heavier when it's vertical, it's, it's, uh, it's lighter, right? But you can see there that what I've done there, this is a close up of that box. Once again, it is important to emphasize that one of the basic purposes of this text is not to teach trigonometry, which is what would be used to calculate these exact vectors if the goal was to be precise and as possible. Rather, the purpose of the discussion 
is to gain an understanding of what constitutes more or less, when it's better to have it be more, when it's better to have it be less, or when it's not good to have it be less or not good to have it be more, right? So the resistance curve requires an understanding of the moment arm. And apparently Mike doesn't understand it and didn't understand what I wrote in that letter. I mean, one of the comments in one of our YouTubes by an engineer was that that was the best explanation of moment arm that he'd heard. And he was a graduate of, of engineering class. So it, it, is, it is precise. So the thing is this, that exercise physiology, and apparently Mike's background is in exercise physiology, typically excludes mechanics as part of the curriculum. Now, that's not me saying it. This is other people that have exercise science, physiology, uh, PhDs telling me this, right? I know this to be a fact. So I'd like you to look at Wayne Westcott's video. He will tell you that he, his background, as most physiologists, is typically lacking in biomechanics. Hi, my name is Wayne Westcott. I'm an exercise physiologist. I teach exercise science at Quincy College in Quincy, Massachusetts. I've written 30 uh, books and textbooks. Then I've written chapters for another uh, about 15 uh, certification books and other large scale uh, productions. So I'd say, you know, about three dozen all together. I'm an old timer. Uh, Doug's book is absolutely phenomenal. Never read anything like it. Uh, his knowledge of biomechanics and physics and his you know, practical experience of, of, of being one of the top bodybuilders in the world. The combination is unbeatable and I just overwhelmed by reading it. Doug's knowledge surpasses anyone I've, I've really ever met in the field of strength training. Uh, we do have some excellent biomechanists in our field of, of exercise science or biomechanics, but his practical application is, is absolutely unmatched in anyone that I've ever met. So I would, I would rank him as, as right at the very top, uh, keeping in mind also that many of us, I had a biomechanics course when I was in college. Um, unlike many of the people my age, my college was uh, Penn State and they actually initiated biomechanics. So I learned a little bit about that, but as an exercise physiologist, uh, I didn't pursue that area. And I think that a lot of people in my profession would be in that same category that they, they know a lot about exercise physiology, but they're not as well versed in the biomechanics, especially in the practical application to resistance exercise. That's a very good question. There are a lot of uh, exercise science professors who do strength training, but like most of us, we train the way that we were taught and we have our favorite exercises and we, we, you know, we worked hard to be the best we can be, mostly in, in how much weight we can lift rather than how, how we can lift more safely and more productively, more effectively and more efficiently. And we haven't really thought about it as much as we should have. We may have thought about how many days per week we should train, you know, and how many sets and how many reps, but the actual lifting mechanics is something that has not been addressed uh, very, very well in my opinion or to any major degree in my opinion. I believe that it's important to pursue the biomechanical aspect of exercise. And I'm a little disappointed that some of our major certifying bodies have eliminated that chapter from their, from their textbooks. I think it's very important. Uh, it's what makes the difference between safe workouts and unsafe workouts. It what's make, it, it's what makes the difference between um, more effective and less effective workouts. And it certainly makes a difference between more time efficient or less time efficient uh, workouts that I think are, uh, the, all three of those components are important for the average person and even the advanced person who's trying to train in a very busy lifestyle. They, you know, doesn't want to be injured, doesn't want to spend a uh, useless time and doesn't have a lot of extra time to spend as well. You know, man, it's a really tough uh, picture to paint. The math is wrong too by itself, but even just at a glance, it seems curious and is in fact wrong. And it's very easy to be wrong in biomechanics uh, just by making a, a few assumptions that seem correct, but but in, in, in fact not correct. So uh, we've got to be really, really careful about that. I, I will add another thing. When you guys go out into the world and, you know, you're consuming exercise science knowledge from as many people as you can, which is a great idea. Uh, there have been recently a sort of a, a, a perhaps a perceived inflection of folks um, 
using biomechanics as kind of a buzzword, like, yeah, but have you thought about biomechanics? Now, biomechanics is cool and all, but it's not some kind of thing you sprinkle on and it makes everything better. And it is a thing that can be really fucked up. So anytime someone says, well, biomechanically, I would take that with a huge grain of salt. So um, the first thing I want to say is in response to his belief that when you're doing parallel bar dips, it's, it's hard to believe is what he said. It's hard to believe that you can only get 11% loading on your tricep because you can just feel it in your bones, in your elbows, in your wrists. And well, you're using body weight, right? You're, 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 if you weigh 200 pounds, even before you descend, just with elbows locked, even before you're loading any muscle, even with just vertical limbs, which is against support beams, that is somewhat challenging to, to, to maintain your body weight on your hands, just as it is to stand in a power rack with 500 pounds on your back. You can feel the load. You can feel it throughout every bone in your body, even if muscles aren't individually loaded, right? So you cannot use that, right? We're talking about muscle load. It is undeniable. It is a hundred percent provable. You can ask any per any person who understands physics. This part is physics that a horizontal forearm will load the tricep more than a vertical forearm will. And if it's only slightly away from perfectly vertical, then you're only getting 11% of your body weight times the length of your form, of course. That's why it still feels heavy, right? But it is not technically as heavy as it would be if you use a more efficient. And this is, by the way, this is what people love about our program is they get more load with less skeletal strain. Now, some people say, I like the skeletal strain. All right, knock yourself out, right? But you can get a killer tricep workout without having to feel that kind of joint strain that you feel during a parallel bar dip. Um, the other thing he was talking about, the buzzword of biomechanics. And, and unfortunately, I agree with that. I, I do see a lot of people using the word biomechanics and hypertrophy in their whatever you want to call it, their title, their Instagram account, um, to create the impression that they are somehow science-based. So uh, I have a slide here, slide 22. I've erased this person's name. I don't want to offend anyone, but I do want you to see that he has hypertrophy and biomechanics. I put the arrows there, by the way. Um, in his specialty, I guess. But the three pictures that I have there are evidence that he doesn't understand even the most fundamental part of biomechanics. He's saying that you should not do chest dumbbell presses with your elbows out to the side like that. That you should bring them in close to your side and do them like this instead of doing them like this. He says, this is easier on the shoulders and is just as effective for the pecs. It is not just as effective for the pecs. It's a different exercise. It's a different direction of anatomical motion. And the, 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 the rule is, and this is the rule, that muscles pull toward their origin. So if the first thing you want to do is to, to, to identify how productive for a particular target muscle is the anatomical motion of an exercise. Ask yourself, is the muscle insertion moving toward the muscle origins? Is it going away from the origins of the chest and then toward the origins of the chest? That, imagine that little man pulling that rope, right? So when you're doing this, you're moving toward the front deltoid insertion origin and maybe a little bit of the clavicular pectoral origin, but you are not moving toward the sternal origin. So this is not equally effective for the pecs. And for this person to call himself a biomechanics expert, I guess, authority, is just basically a punchline. It is not an accurate representation of what biomechanics is all about. And then doing EMG, uh, electromyography, to figure out how active the muscles are in certain positions that uh, can we can dispose of sort of just biomechanical calculations on a physics perspective and actually measure muscle activation that makes it much better. Um, I haven't seen any EMG data from, from this group of folks, uh, from, from Doug's propositions. Maybe it's out there. Maybe I've missed it. But even with EMG, um, 
And the research community, EMG, for exercise science applications is notoriously bad, notoriously bad. Huge uh, problems with signal-to-noise ratio, huge error rates, sometimes exercises that are sort of known by people to cause more disruption, more soreness, bigger pumps, everything like that, or mainstay exercises and growing a muscle group are shown uh, through EMG to be inferior to exercises that, like, I didn't even know that muscle was really active a ton in that exercise. So it, it leaves you thinking, gee, you know, is there something being missed? And almost certainly uh, top folks doing EMG research will tell you, yeah, it's something you take with a huge, huge fucking grain of salt. And, and uh, at, at, you have to use other methods. And EMG by itself can't be reliably like, well, this wins on EMG and this loses. So uh, we have to do the thing that wins. Right? So that's point number two. So in regard to the EMG analysis, um, you know, Mike justifiably doesn't have a lot of faith in EMG analysis, and I don't either. And the, 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 my criticism of EMG analysis is that it tells us, those of us that really understand biomechanics, it tells us what is predictably obvious, right? For example, it'll tell you that, um, oh, guess what? The uh, rectus femoris um, appears to be inactive when you're doing a leg press or when you're doing uh, a squat. Um, and, and, but those of us who understand biomechanics, because biology and mechanics tells us that reciprocal innervation, which is a neurological thing, would naturally shut off the rectus femoris. It's predictable. The hip extensors are, are firing. They're contracted. They're loaded. The hip flexors have to release. They can't both contract at the same time because then you get no motion, right? So part of the rectus, part of the hip flexors is the rectus femoris. It is predictable. So, duh, an EMG told you that? You needed an EMG to tell you that? Okay. Um, now, the EMG will tell you that the tricep kickback activates the tricep. Okay. But it doesn't tell you that it's not the best resistance curve. It doesn't tell you that it's not early phase loading. In fact, you could put an EMG pad on my chest and I can squeeze my pecs isometrically and it says, oh, your pecs are activated. So from that, we're supposed to surmise that this is a good way to build the pecs. So it, it really stops short of telling you what is good and what is bad or what is simply predictable. If you already know, look, if you put electrodes on the upper pectoral fibers, the highest fibers on the sternum and you do an inclined press, you go, oh, guess what? They're not firing as much as a flat dumbbell press. Well, duh. That's because the muscles aren't pulling toward their origin right? It's a predictable thing when you know biomechanics. So an EMG analysis doesn't tell you much at all. It really isn't very informative. If you know biomechanics and can already predict these things, and if you know that what appears to be a green light for, let's say, the triceps is actually not such a green light because it's not early phase loaded, it's end phase loaded. And so you naturally have to use a lighter weight than you otherwise would. And you're going to probably start swinging it because you can. So an EMG analysis is, is not a, a very good way of relying on exercise analysis. Point number three, in my view, we may have some superior ways to judge exercise ratios of stimulus to fatigue. And these are the stimulus and fatigue proxies that myself and the folks at Renaissance Periodization have sort of thrust into the spotlight. And you may be familiar with them with a bunch of YouTube videos about them. So if you Google any of them or just uh, YouTube stimulus to fatigue ratio, and I talk about it in like at least three videos till you're blue in the face and don't give a shit anymore. Um, and these are things like how much tension are you perceiving in the muscle? So for example, if someone's like, hey, like try the skull crushers like this, and you're like, okay, I feel my triceps, same load. And they're like, We're try them close. like that. And you're like, holy fucking shit. I really feel like my triceps pulling like crazy. This is probably not wrong. It may be wrong, but at least if you feel a shitload of tension in your triceps doing an exercise one way or doing another exercise or doing the same one a different way, would you feel much less tension? I don't know, man. It kind of seems like the high tension exercises on average are probably better and it doesn't end there. Another one is burn. Okay. If I tell you, hey, listen, the way I'm having you do lunges, it's going to fuck your glutes up. And you do the lunges, do the lunges, do the lunges. And I'm like, what do you think? Where do you feel it? You're like, my quads are on fire. And I'm like, uh-huh. And what about your glutes? You're like, I don't, I don't know. I don't really feel my glutes. No burn, nothing. 
uh, you know, are we really to believe that this is a huge glute targeting exercise that a lot of bad things could be said about that exercise, but a, a too little quad stimulus probably isn't one of them. Now, that's just on the stimulus side. There's also the fatigue side. So given that the exercises stimulate you pretty well as far as we can proxy with these, do they cause a lot of joint and connective tissue stress? If I have you do squat crushers like this, you're like, ow, my elbows, ow, my elbows. If I have you switch to doing them like this, you're like, oh shit, my elbows feel totally fine. Like one of those is probably the right answer no matter what biomechanics says, because if you're gonna grind your joints off your fucking body, no number of physics equations can make you feel good about that. And then of course, there's the issue of systemic fatigue. And this is where I think, uh, it's just a disagreement, but I think uh, Doug Brignol and his folks there have a pretty good point. Some exercises are so fucking fatiguing and you question like, for what? A lot of the exercises he offers aren't as fatiguing. So maybe they're better trade off of stimulus to fatigue, which is the stimulus to fatigue ratio, right? And that's kind of asking the question between exercises of two different stimulus and fatigue ratios, it, you know, set for set, how many sissy squats do I have to do to get the same raw stimulus magnitude, which is like tension, pump, burn, et cetera, all hints at that, versus how much fatigue is imposed versus like full ROM hacks or leg presses. So, you know, if you are curious about these methods and you start doing sissy squats, like the cable sissy squats he shows where he pulls the cable and squats all the way up and down, you know, you do five of those or sets of those close to failure, oh, man, my quads are pretty fucked up. How does it compare to like five sets of hack squats or full range of motion leg presses? If it compares better and it gives you less fatigue, fuck and do that shit forever. But if after five sets of sissy squats, you're like, oh, yeah, my quads are fucked up. That's sweet. But after five sets of hack squats, your quads are like balloon animals going to burst and everything is right with this world. Then, gee, is someone really going to tell you like, oh, hack squats are inferior? Like, are they really? My quads sure don't feel like it and my fatigue is fine, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that was disagreement point number three. So one of the things that Mike says is, doesn't it matter what the muscle is feeling? regardless of what biomechanics tells us we should be feeling. Well, again, that to me sounds like a, a, a fundamental lack of understanding of what biomechanics, biomechanics tells us. Biomechanics literally pulls no surprises on us. That's the beauty of this is that when you know where the load goes and why it goes there, that's when you go, wow, I had no idea that this exercise that seemed so simple could feel so challenging, right? This is the way it works. It doesn't go the other way. It doesn't, it, it, there's, there's no case in any of the exercise that we recommend where we say, well, you should be feeling it here. What, what do you mean you're not? That, that never ever happens. And, and you would know this if you just saw the feedback that people who are on the Brick 20 are posting whenever they respond to a video. They say, Holy crap, I had no idea I could get such a blazing workout with these exercises. That's the way it goes. It doesn't go the other way. I, I, I don't know what he, he's, he's characterizing biomechanics as being sort of like a witch doctor kind of thing that, you know, doesn't make sense in the real world. It, it totally makes sense in the real. In fact, much more so than conventional training. It is logical. 100% predictable. That's the beauty of this thing. So the other thing I wanted to say was, um, Mike says that there's a claim that these exercises are the best for growth. How do you know that? Okay, the first thing I would say is we don't ever say these exercises are the best for growth, right? Because obviously growth depends on a lot of things, depends on intensity, depends on genetics, depends if you're supplementing on and on and on. Um, but, but, but here's the thing is what we know is that load makes a muscle grow. That's what we know. More load makes a muscle grow more. Period. So if I, if I show you why you can load your quadriceps with 1200 pounds of resistance on a cable sissy squat and only 950 pounds of load when doing a barbell squat with 200 pounds, and I'm not throwing 200 pounds out like it's an impressive amount of weight, just to give you a contrast that you can get more load with a sissy squat with cables than you can with a barbell. Will, will they feel the same? No, you won't feel the compression of the spine and the participation of the glutes when you're doing the cable sissy squat. But you are absolutely positively getting more load on your quadriceps and your quadriceps will benefit more from it than it would from a 950 pound load on your, on your quadriceps. Now, 
obviously it's not a compound movement. So you have to supplement gluteus exercise. But if you did do a simultaneous compound exercise, gluteus and quads, you're disengaging your rectus femoris. So that's the reason to separate them, right? You can load the glutes better, heavier, without putting anything on your spine. And you can load the quadriceps better, heavier, without putting anything on your spine. And the glutes and the quads will grow more. Logically speaking, they have to, right? More load. We're not arguing about load. More load equals more growth. So what I want to show you is, because he says, so we know what's been working for the past 20 years, right? Um, but we don't know. We haven't seen anybody using Brignoli methods and competing. Well, here's slide number 23. This is Jim Everton. He just posted this today, by the way. And below his pictures, he says, current quad progress picks utilizing Doug Brignoli and the physics of resistance exercise training methods over the last year. Those are pretty damn good quads, right? That's one. These are some of the other people. This person is saying, this is blowing my mind. This person says that in the middle, best book I've ever, I've ever read. If you're looking to get, rid of, get into fitness, work out currently, or wish to train clients, you must read this book, facts only, no opinions. And then the last one is a, is a doctor of physical therapy, Dr. Shannon. She says, I'm often asked what my favorite books are. If you are a fitness pro, you need this book, full stop. The person on the left says, Doug, I gotta, I, I, I've got to say, I've been a personal trainer for 18 years. Listen to you on Mark Bell's podcast. Everything you said blew my mind. You make everything make 100% sense. You can read that for yourself. The one on the right, I've been following Doug's advice for two years. Never had better results from my training without joint pain. I'll never go back to my old training methods again. The, the, it is happening, but keep in mind, it's only been out there a year, right? How much can be done in a year, right? We've got people doing this other training methods for nearly a century, right? So there's lots of time for them. And I'm, by the way, I'm not saying those methods don't work. I'll get back to that in a minute. Uh, on the left there, thanks. Uh, your info is goal currently six months into following your routine. Never felt or looked better at 54 years old. Here is a video from Alvanzo, the uh, Elvis Alvanzo from Italy, talking about uh, his uh, way of training. He's been training the Brick 20 for four years now. When you started implementing Doug's training for the last, you said, five or four years? Uh, five years. Five years. You're a professional. I mean, now you got your card, so you're uh, like a professional bodybuilder. Do you think that this method can really get you to build muscle that allow you to compete? Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, every, every part of the body. Um, change it, uh, become better every part of, it, of its body. So he saw the change in its body and he know that it's in particular, the time. in particular the details of the body. When he saw uh, the difference the before and then of the detail of the muscle, yeah. of the muscle, okay, he know that it was the best uh, way for its work. How fast did he notice the change? Mm, no, no. Maybe one more or less one year. Hi, my name is Renzo and I've been involved with health and fitness for the past 46 years. Predominantly, it's been bodybuilding. That said, I thought I knew just about everything there was to know about building muscle. However, when I discovered Doug Brignoli's biomechanics, Smart Training 365, I became very defensive about old school techniques, understandably. I mean, I've been doing them for 46 years, but I simply couldn't find anything scientifically to support my beliefs and those of all the old champions that I followed. Doug Brignoli's methods, however, are by design scientific, using biomechanics and physics and are completely undisputable. One cannot alter the laws of physics, can they? So I had to concede. So I went ahead and I did the course. I have to say it was a revelation for me and I found 
using these logical, efficient techniques, that my body began to respond once again at age 60. I began to grow muscle. Fortunately, Doug and his business partner, Mo, have evolved things even more with the addition of their new course called True Bodybuilding. This course complements the original biomechanics one perfectly and details essentials for building muscle like nutrition, supplementation, training splits, and even competition prep if you're that way inclined. With both courses, you literally have a complete detailed blueprint for developing a fantastic physique, and I cannot recommend them both enough. They've been life-changing for me. Give them a try. I guarantee you won't look back. So there's lots of people out there commenting. They're using it. They're getting good results from it. But, but here's the thing is, um, when, you, when you talk about the old method has been working for so many years, why change, right? Well, the reason why change, and, and I'm not saying you must, or you can experiment with some of this and some of that, proof of arrival is not proof of the best road, right? So you can get to a location a destination, taking a very rough, rocky, bumpy, muddy, wet road, which is the equivalent of the inefficiency of a lot of traditional weight training exercises, right? There's a smoother road you can take where you get a bigger percentage of the weight that you're using so that you don't have to use as much weight to get as much or more muscle load. That preserves your skeleton, your spine, your joints. By the way, it also serves as less of a psychological deterrent right? If you think you've got to go into the gym and, and pound that weight on your back, then you might not want to go. Maybe it turns you on. I don't know. But the point is you don't have to do that to get muscle load. There's better, smarter ways to get as much or more muscle load and better muscle development or as good muscle without getting beat up. So the other thing Mike says is new stuff comes along all the time. Um, and what stays is the traditional stuff. Well, you know, you have a point. New stuff does come up all the time and BS stuff comes up frequently. That doesn't mean everything that comes up is BS. It just means that a lot of it is, right? So I understand the challenge of thinking, oh, this is so avant-garde, as, as he said, that, you know, it's going to come and go. It's going to be pop. Well, it's logical. It's scientific. It's factual. You can test it yourself. Test it yourself. Don't take my word for it. Um, he says, everyone is different, right? Well, I say, okay, everyone is different, right? But everyone's elbow does the same thing. Everyone's knee does the same thing. Everyone's shoulder does the same thing. Biomechanics is universal. Physics is universal, right? So what we do is we say, here are the 16 factors. Here are the guidelines. This is the thing this pectoral muscle does most ideally. Second, most ideally, third, most ideally, fourth, fifth, sixth. So pretty soon you've moved so far away from the ideal that it doesn't even resemble a pectoral exercise, right? But this is what it does ideally. So your odds are highest of getting the goal you want when you do what that muscle does primarily. Is it not worth knowing what that muscle does primarily? Would you be better off not looking, not hearing, not knowing what that muscle dies primarily. Mike says he loves bent over barbell rowing. Okay. I don't doubt that he loves it. But when you do a bent over barbell row, you're, there are certain muscles that are pulling on the arms, which are holding onto the weight. And then there's the erector spinae that is not only holding the weight of your torso, but holding the weight that's in your arms, along with the magnification of the length of the torso. So your lower back is loaded more than whatever muscles are pulling the arms that are pulling the weight. So that's one demerit. The other demerit of a bent over barbell row is that are the muscles moving toward their origins? Are the insertions moving toward their origins? Well, if you're trying to get to the lats, I can tell you that the arms are not moving toward the spine because that comes in, down and in. If you're going to the back of the room, the lats will participate, but that's not what they primarily do. If you're trying to get your middle trapezius, the middle trapezius don't even connect to the arms. So they're not 
participating in the arm part of that. What is participating mostly in the arm part of that is the rear deltoids. Now, yes, if you bring your elbows way far back because you've got a cambered bar, you will incidentally bring your shoulders back more, but you can bring your shoulders back without involving so much rear deltoid and so much lower back. These are factual things. These are guidelines you can use to improve the way your workout feels, reduce the energy cost, decrease the, the injury risk, and improve the muscle loading. It's all logical. It's not opinion. It's not, I'm not throwing, you know, a dart at a dartboard. It's all spelled out. Now, one of the things Mike says is, what do you say when I'm getting sick and tired of these same exercises? And I say, all right, let's just say you get sick and tired of breathing air. What are your options? Well, you can breathe helium, you can breathe other things, but you won't get as good a result. You just won't, right? If you want to get a tan, then you have your better options, UV light, sun, tanning bed. What if you want incandescent? What if you want fluorescent? What if you want neon? No, they, they don't work as good, if at all, right? What if you're tired of getting in the sun? Tough. Now, I'm not saying you have to do the Brick 20, but what I am saying is when you know why the Brick 20 are the better exercises, then you are well informed enough to know what would be second best, third best, fourth. So if you want to go to the gym and either they don't have the equipment you need or you don't have access to the gym and you want to, you know, come close to the ideal, we've spelled out all the options for you. Here's second best, third best, fourth best, fifth. Go for it. But you will know that it's not reasonable for you to expect an optimum benefit when you're moving your arms in a less than optimal direction of resistance, given what that muscle actually does, or that you're using a less than optimal direction of resistance. Because you know that the ideal resistance, direction of resistance, will give you the better resistance curve, will give you the better alignment, right? Will give you the, uh, it's just a much safer way to go, right? So if you want to move away from that, that's fine but you're informed and you're doing such as like, if you're driving to a location, you want to take a different route. It's a longer route. Go ahead. But you know what the shorter route is and you know why you're taking the longer route and, and the trade-off is worth it to you. So um, uh, in closing, I, I just want to play Jim Peterson's video, which is my publisher. Um, but, you know, more importantly, what I, what I want to be able to say here is, is, you know, it's, uh, I find myself in an odd position, frankly, because I didn't set out to reinvent resistance exercise. That wasn't my goal. In fact, I tend to be shy. I tend to be reserved. Um, I, I, I've been at this for 43, 44 years, and I started dissecting stuff when I was 15, 16, 17 years old and started modifying exercises in ways that would later prove to be correct from an anatomical, biomechanical, physiological standpoint. I didn't know it at the time, and I didn't intend to share it. I, I in fact, back then, in the 70s and 80s, you know, you, there was really no venue where you could share, right? There were magazines muscle and fitness flex. And they told you what you wanted, what they, you, you, you were going to be writing. You don't tell them what you're going to, in fact, if you tell them that you want to write something that's unconventional, they're probably going to shoo you away. No matter how correct it is. Magazines typically don't care about what's scientifically correct. They care about selling magazines, right? So there was really no venue. I had no interest. It just so happened that I, I, I tend to be extremely analytical and I tend to do a ton of research and it's all in the literature. Everything that I say in the book is corroborated. All you got to do is Google anything that's talked about in my book, whether it's bilateral deficit, reciprocal innovation, cross education, active insufficiency. You can look all of these things up. No one had ever put them in one book. I don't know why. And so I find myself in an awkward position to be putting this information out there that is all factual and true and accurate, provably accurate. Um, and, and so it, 
but because this so rarely happens. And so often what happens is people selling new stuff that isn't really legitimate that I might get bunched up in, into this, you know, Oh, just another thing, just another new thing. But in this case, it happens to not be the case. Uh, and I, 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 I just want to put the information out there and, and, and whatever you do, you do. I don't care. I, I'm not trying to, you know, change the world. It might, but I'm not trying to do that. I just think it's fascinating stuff. And everyone who's read the book will read the reviews on Amazon. Everyone who's read the book, look at what, you know, Wayne Westcott says, look at what, you know, um, the endorsers of my book say. I mean, it's, it's, it's a bizarre thing that I landed upon all of these truths that have been there underneath our noses, but not out in the open uh, in any one place. I find myself in the awkward position to be the one delivering this information. Um, so be it. I'm sorry. But anyway, enjoy this video with uh, Jim Peterson. My name is Dr. Jim Peterson. I am a fellow of the American College of Sports Medicine. I taught at West Point for 20 years. I'm the director of sports medicine for Stairmaster, which my brother founded. I've written more than 100 or co-authored more than 100 books. And uh, when I was at West Point, I generally was in charge of the facilitating and developing the philosophy of strength training that cadets follow. The other thing that, that, that may be of note with regard to West Point is I'm the only instructor from 71 to 90 who taught every cadet. So I'm the only person in the world who can honestly say that he had Atreus as a student in McChrystal and Pompeo and most of the famous West Point generals uh, from from uh, 71 to 90, I taught. I taught every one of them. Every once in a while, in a very rare case, we 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 run into we we uh, we encounter a book or an individual like Doug who is so bright and so focused on what he does and what he's trying to do that it's indeed uh, it's indeed an honor to be his publisher. Well. The, the truth be known, I was both surprised, pleased, and ashamed. I was surprised that it was so well written. I I was uh, pleased that uh, we have the honor of publishing this book, and I was ashamed that uh, in my career of advising people, and and and, and I was pretty intricately involved in the, the strength training focus at West Point and getting these young men and women ready to serve in the armed forces that I had never encountered this information before. And my initial reaction is, my God, how differently I would do things and said things and guided people had I had the opportunity to run into Doug earlier in my professional career. Well, in, in, in all honesty, I, I, I'm a firm believer that strength training generally receives short shrift in the area of uh, fitness. Uh, most of the most of the fitness books tend to focus on the aerobic end or on occasion the flexibility end. As far as strength training goes, uh, well, frankly, as far as any fitness book I've ever read goes, it's the best written, the most well thought out, the most revolutionary book I've ever personally read. It, it addresses uh, relatively complex concepts for the average person in a very user-friendly way. I, I've never read a book that literally make me want to go back in my life and talk to everybody that I've advised. I mean, I, I was a reasonably popular professor at West Point. I was because I, I treated them like humans, not like cadets. Consequently, cadets came to me for advice, particularly, uh, particularly strength training advice. I mean, in all honesty, my only advice in aerobic things, use your big muscles, get the heartbeat, try to keep it going for 12, 15 minutes. If you can, don't sit on an exercise cycle, which is the worst exercise known to mankind. And the rest of it is up to you. I don't care what it is you do, try to listen to your body. So I mean, that whole, my whole aerobic speech lasts about 15 seconds. But I, I've been interacted with literally thousands, maybe tens of thousands of people over the years about strength training, very strength training things because I was approachable and I had the, you know, uh, the, the one aspect that, that, that Doug and I agree upon and, and, and that's one of the things that may be interested in his book. Uh, more is not better, you know, and, I, and I, I really didn't expect that from a so-called bodybuilder. I mean, it never occurred to me that I, 
I'm real. I was very, very close friends with the late Steve Reeves. I'm, I consider myself real close friends with Bill Pearl. And we, we agree to disagree per, periodically. But what Doug's saying is, it, it, he, he just took my thinking to another level. My thinking was more is not better. Figure out what to do. Do enough and don't do any more because it, it's not it's counterproductive. And Doug's philosophy is not only is more not better, but certain things are better than even when you're doing less. It's, certain things are the best things to do, not because I produce results with them, which is how most people judge what they do. Well, look at me. What the hell? I look like a god. So what I'm doing must be the right way. Well, I've long believed that the underlying philosophy of that statement is, well, maybe you look the way you do, not because of what you do, but in spite of it. And, it, it, you know, sometimes this happens because you have great genetic gifts or things worked out for you. It's not necessarily uh, a, a template for anybody. And what Doug's book does, Doug's book gives people a template on how to do it in the most effective and time efficient way. Well, I hope uh, you enjoyed the video. Thank you, Doug, for uh, the well-searched uh, answers. And uh, I saw that you uh, took pictures of the book and, you know, all that. It took time. That's why, like, uh, it didn't, uh, it wasn't fast to uh, deliver this uh, answer. But I hope you enjoy it. Uh, to Mike Israel, uh, I hope this video also answers the questions that you asked, and I hope uh, the viewers also benefited from the the answers, Doug, that uh, you know you provided with details. If you liked this video, or if you agree or don't agree, let us know in the comment section. If you want to see something that wasn't discussed in this video and you want to see it covered in the next video, whether it's from Mike Israel or from Doug, let us know in the comment section. Make sure uh, you subscribe to our channel if you like this content and uh, share this video if you know other people interested in this subject. Thank you very much and we'll see you in the next video. Thank you.